Okay, so we are in Shmuel chapter 1, verse 12. We'll take it from there. When we last left off, Chana, who is Shmuel's mother-to-be, she was at that time barren, and she was pouring her heart out in the Mishkan in Shiloh. She was very distressed, and she was sitting there uh, davening and davening after she had become so distressed from the way that her co-wife Penina treated her. All she wanted was a child for Hashem's sake. And we we saw the content and the nature of her prayer last time. On the one hand, it was very fierce and almost, almost aggressive towards God, if you will. On the other hand, it was purely for the honor and for the sake of Hashem. So a very impassioned and bold tefillah from Chana, which was she was in the she was in the midst of. And that leads us to verse number 12. As it says there, Vahayakir Betalit Pilalif Nashem. It was when she was praying a lot in front of God, meaning to say this was a long prayer, which was unusual. It was unusually long, and that caught Eli's attention. Eli was the Kohen Gadol. Eli Shomer Espia. Uh, Eli is watching her mouth. And the verse says, V'chana himi aliba. But Chana was not verbalized, not uh, verbalizing her to Philos, or I should say they weren't audible. You couldn't hear them. Rocks fatea naot. Only her lips were moving. The kola lo You can't hear. You couldn't hear her voice. So vayachsheveha Eli leshikora. Eli thought she was drunk. This is a story we know from the Haftorah. What we see from here it, it, is it wasn't common to daven silently. Today we have the silent Shmona Esrei. The Gemara actually learns from Chana the way that we daven. It's as if she like instituted this new thing that this is a, this is actually an appropriate and ideal way to daven is medaberas aliba where nobody could hear you it's just you and Hashem. I just was reminded uh, as we were reading this. I once to uh, I was in Asia Torah in Israel in 2005, and there's a rav over there who's exceedingly humble. He'd probably resent me even saying so. His name was uh, Rabbi Ellis. And I once went to him and I said, like, how, how does a person achieve humility? Like, what's the secret? You know, what, what juice do you drink? What button do I push? So he said, you know, he said, I don't know. And I don't know why you're asking me, as a humble person would say. And he meant it honestly. He wasn't shtick. Really a fantastic person, Bli Ainara. And but he said, but he, he said, the next time you pray Shmona Esrei, the silent Amida prayer, he said, take a minute before you step in and realize what's about to happen. Just take a moment to reflect on what you're about to do. And then he walked three steps forward, and you're not even supposed to raise your voice, just a whisper. Why? Because how close would you have to speak if somebody's ear was right here? I remember him making the motion with his hand. If someone's ear was right here, how loud would you have to speak? Very, very quietly. He said, like, if, if that's where Hashem is standing, right? if, if you have continuous and consistent encounters with the God <laughs> and you actually sent that he's right here in front of you, that will make a person humble. Yeah, just like if you continue to sit on a cushion, you sit on a cushion many, many times, the cushion will, will end up getting a groove in it. So, so too, if we come into a contact that closely with God on a regular basis, as we step into our prayers, whether it's the silent Shmon Esrei or just the quiet prayers we offer him throughout our day, which is also very important, then those constant encounters will lead us to become humble and great. and great. So that's a, a beautiful lesson we learned from Chana about the, the silent prayer. Now, fascinatingly, the Ramban brings down, when, uh, when he talks about the Urim Vitumim, the clothing, the vestments of the Kohen Gadol, he talks about the way that uh, they were used. As we know, I think we might have gone over this maybe in, in, uh, in Yeshua at one point, so we'll just run through it briefly. But you know that they used to ask questions to the Urim Vitumim. Um, I don't know if there's a translation for that in English or if it's just transliterated. But it was the twelve, you know, the 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 breastplate of the Kohen, and they would actually ask questions: Should we go to war? Who should go first? Like we saw in Joshua, Yehuda Yaalei. Yehuda was told to go up first. So here, Eli actually, this is the day that he became a Kohen Gadol. It was just this day that he was promoted to the office of a Kohen Gadol, the the primary Kohen. And he act when he's upon seeing Chana, who presumably was a righteous lady. She was married to Elkanah, who was one of the great leaders of the generation. 
So he, he didn't just say, hey, what are you doing? You're drunk. He first went to the Urm Vitumin, his the breastplate that he wore, and he asked to God, what's with this lady? God, tell me about her. Should I judge her? And the word, the letters lit up. Chaf, Samich, Resh, Hey. Right? Each tribe had its name written out on the breastplate with a, and the names of the, the three forefathers. That has all 22 letters of the olive base. And the letter, the four letters lit up. I'll make a whiteboard. I think I'm having deja vu. We must have done this once before, but it's it's worthwhile to review because we're, we're holding gear right now. These letters lit up. Um, um, Shin, Chaf, Reish, Hey. Those letters lit up on the Kohen Gadol's breastplate. So he reads them and he says, oh, I know what that means. That's that's a shin, she, ko, ra. She's drunk. So Hashem is conveying to me that she's drunk. And then, of course, as we know, she says to him, sir, I'm not drunk. I'm pouring my heart out. So where was his mistake? He asked the word Matum. And the Ramban says he misinterpreted the message. These letters, he did not arrange them properly. He got the right letters lit up, of course. But the actual arrangement was meant to be Chaf, Samech, uh, the sin, sorry. Uh, Reish Hey, which is Kishera, she's kosher, or alternatively Kesara, she's like Sarah Imenu, she's righteous, she's kosher. So he did the right thing. He asked him to him. He got the right letters, but he arranged it the wrong way, and therefore he misunderstood the scenario, and deemed her that, as a drunk lady, and therefore he chastised her. So he says to her in verse number fourteen, "What are you doing, drunk?" You are, first of all, you're not allowed to pray while you're drunk. It's an important halacha to know. A person is so drunk that he cannot stand before the king. He must wait until that passes, and then that, then you can go and, and, and daven. And secondly, you're in the mishkan. You're currently in a holy place. You cannot walk into the sanctuary drunk. So she says to him, No, my master, I'm not drunk. I'm kishat ruach. I have a harsh spirit. I did not drink any alcohol. Va'eshpoch. I have poured my soul out before God, which is such a beautiful and powerful expression. Can you imagine just the, the expression to pour your heart out? It becomes a it's become a cliche. But she was the first one documented to pour her heart out. She says the word pour, like if you were to spill a cup of water and the contents just flow forth without anything holding them back. Can you imagine the state of prayer that she achieved? Just, just uh, unadulterated between the heart and the mouth. Everything was just pouring out in front of God. Please don't deem me as a bat balial, as a lady who is uh, unlawful. Because I have many troubles, I don't have a child. The ka'asi and I'm also being harassed by my co-wife, Panina, as we saw last time. That her co-wife was was harassing her and telling her, hey, did you, did you buy new shoes for your, for your kid? I did. And rubbing in that she didn't have a child. So she said, because I'm missing a child and because of this pain that I was caused, I'm davening. So here, Ailey's response is something that the Gemara derives a halacha from. He says in verse number 17, Lechila shalom, go to peace, is the translation. Go to peace, le shalom. Yisrael asher and then he gives her a blessing, and may the God of Israel grant your request which you asked of him. The Talmud learns from here, Anybody who suspects his fellow of doing something wrong, but his fellow is actually innocent. Hey, why did you uh, why did you leave the car without any gas? No, you suspect a family member. Oh, you left the car without gas. They say, oh, no, that wasn't me. So-and-so borrowed the car and he brought it back. Oh, right. Anybody who suspects their fellow of doing something and they didn't actually do that, then the response is, Chayav so he must appease him. I'm so sorry, forgive me for, for suspecting you. And in addition, in, in, in addition, give them a blessing. Eili here appeased her. He said to her, go, go in peace, la shalom. And he gave her a blessing that Hashem should grant her request. Now that's not a stame blessing. That's not a minor thing. He was telling her, okay, Yisrael, he was the Kohen Gadol. And he's tell, standing in the Mishkan, in the holy place of God. And he's telling her, may Hashem grant your request. In fact, it could be here 
that he was actually making a statement and not a blessing. It could be he was telling her, according to some Farshim, Hashem will grant your request. At that moment, he saw prophetically that Hashem answered her prayers and that she was in fact going to conceive a child. So from here, the Gemara learned that if you suspect your fellow and wrongfully, then you must appease him and give him a bracha. And give him a bracha. Uh, there's an interesting uh, note here. He says to her, Lechi shalom. And the Gemara distinguishes, this is a, a point in Hebrew, when you're talking to a person who is alive, you do not say go beshalom, in peace, but rather go to peace, toward peace. Because uh, once a person's passed away, we say beshalom. Enuach beshalom amishkavo. They should rest in peace and be with, right? peace should be with them. But to a living person, like here Chana was alive, he's telling her you should go towards peace, meaning to say you should continue ascending to higher levels of shalom in your life. You never want to tell a person that you've already arrived at the final destination. We've only arrived once we've, once we've finished. Wait, as long as we're alive, we're continuously going towards peace. At least that's our hope. So he was telling her, continue growing. Take this power of tefillah that you've just exercised, and you should continue going onwards and upwards. And in addition, I give you a blessing, right? I pronounce to you prophetically that your 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 prayer was answered. Okay, beautiful little lessons we learned from Ailey here. Uh, and she says, "Wow, your your maids of servant should find favor in your eyes." And now, uh, but she goes on her way, vatochal, and she eats. We saw beforehand that she was not able to eat because she was so distressed. But now you see what a lady of faith she was. It's in the bag. The Kohen Gadol told me I'm having a child. He gave me a blessing. I can I can be at ease. And she goes and eats. And she actually eats. And her sad face was no longer sad. She was already happy and delighted. In verse number 19, they wake up in the morning. They uh, they were they spent the night in Shiloh, evidently, like in, near the Mishkan. And then they go home. They go to bow before God, and then they return home. Who, who is returning home? Now this is Elkana and Chana and the family. They had come to the Mishkan to, to pray for Chana. They spent the night. And the following morning, Elkana and Chana, Chana and her husband, are going back home. And the co-wife, Panina, was there as well. Right? Yeah? I, I always had the impression that there was the family stress. In, in, intra-family stress in the Chana household. But yeah. This different. This, this doesn't sound like... They all came together to support her in her goal to have a child. Yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting point. Yeah, like we said, the Panina, even her co-wife, was trying to encourage her to pray by uh, by stressing her, so, which is a strange tactic. Uh but it's interesting, you're right. It sounds like they're all here to help Chana. It's an interesting point. Yeah. Um, so it says that they wake up in the morning, they go to bow before God. Uh, from here we learn another important lesson. Why were they bowing? First of all, she just got a Besorah Tova. She got good news. So she went and she thanked God for it, which is a beautiful thing. Anytime something good happens in our life, we must take the opportunity to thank God. Right? When things go bad, I think there's a, it's ingrained in us to turn to God and ask for help because we feel hopeless. But when things go great, we also must turn to God and say thank you. Additionally, they were about to leave the Mishkan. You don't just leave. You have to go and bow and say goodbye to your master. Right? We, you're in a place of extreme closeness to God. You cannot just walk away from that without parting ways. Um, yeah. In, in fact, it says that when you're leaving the city, should go to the Rav of the city and ask him, or at least bid him farewell. I'm, I'm leaving now and ask for a blessing or something. We should go and see him. You don't just leave a place of holiness or a person of a great stature. So that's what we learned from, from this. And again, there's many little has, lessons tucked in here in this uh, beautiful piece. And so now it says, There is, uh, and it was, um, uh, after a few months, Chana, uh, conceived and, and gave birth to a child. She named him Shmuel. Because I requested him from God. So the, the verse is indicating that the name Shmuel is like a contraction or like some acronym. Uh, the letters represent 
I have requested him from God. Now Adonai She'il Tiv. So El is Hashem's name. So May El, like I asked him from God. The Shin doesn't quite fit. It's not quite clear how. Uh, oh, maybe the Shin is She'il Tiv. I've requested May Mu'el from God. I've requested from God. I requested the child from God, basically. Um, the Rashi brings down, fascinatingly, the Jewish people at that time had a tradition that the next great leader of the Jewish people, his name would be Shmuel. So many mother, many mothers were naming their child Shmuel because they wanted they wanted to have the kid, and they said, "This is the one. This is the one." But sure enough, their child their child would grow up, and they'd see from his actions that this is not the Shmuel. This is not the Shmuel. So perhaps here also, Chana was naming her son Shmuel. First of all, it fits. Right? I've requested him from God. It sort of fits. But more importantly, there's a tradition that uh, there is going to be a Shmuel who will be great. And uh, may maybe that's why she chose this particular name. And sure enough, he was the one. Uh, a curious Rashi here, or the, the Gemara here, picks on the words and notes that he was born uh, after six months and two days, which is not, uh, yeah, which is, he was a bit premature. The Gemara says that there's two versions of a full-term child. You could have a seven-term, a seven-month full-term or a nine-month full-term. Isn't that fascinating? Nine months we know about. Apparently some babies are meant to come out at seven months. That's what the Gemara says in, in many places throughout the Talmud. And uh, in this case, she gave birth a little earlier than that even, six, six months and two days. So in any case, it was premature. Whether or not we're familiar with this seven-month full-term, uh, it was he was certainly a premature baby. Um, which may account for what we're about to see. Maybe, maybe not. I don't want to stick in the my eighth, own thing. The eighth month is not favored. Yeah, it's too early, you're saying, right? Where's the Gemara? I studied that once. It, so it, it appears in Nida. That's the place I'm thinking. Masech is Nida. And mm -hmm. maybe uh, in uh, Yevamos. Perhaps you saw that there mm -hmm. more recently in your Dafiomi. Okay. I just learned it on Tuesday. It's in Yavamos in the beginning of the fourth parrot. Very nice. Yeah, Yavamos Membes. Very good. And it's also Nida. And if you're Lamed curious. Hay. What's, what what's the power Lamed of the, Hay, I think. What's the power of the eighth month that he, they can't be delivered? I forgot. You thought the conventional science you're talking about? Conventional delivery cannot be in the eighth month. So I have to ask Rabbi Rappaport about it. Okay. Uh, Okay, as far as I know, like when once a lady's reached, oh, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay, Rabbi Airport's the man, you're right, he would know all the baby stuff, the local mohel. <laughs> uh, okay, so she she has this child, he has small. Now, uh, Elkana in verse 21, Elkana goes up, uh, with all of his household to bring sacrifices to God as Zeva Chayamim the Nidro, the sacrifice of the day. And his own vow. What's the sacrifice of the day? Uh, it, evidently, it was the next holiday. Maybe it was... Um, Sh 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 Shmuel was born on... Shmuel was... Oh, I forget the calculation here. But it was the next holiday. Let's say it was Sukkot or, or Pesach. When a person... May, so there's the, the sacrifices you bring for a particular holiday. And anytime a person makes a net or if you make a vow... Then you're obligated to bring a sacrifice. You're obligated to bring that sacrifice to fulfill that vow by the next holiday. You shouldn't delay it. Uh, you shouldn't delay. You should, you should bring it by the next holiday. Okay. So that's what he was doing here. Uh, but he goes with his whole family, and Chana doesn't go up with him because she says to her husband, "Adi Gamel Anar uh, uh, I need to wean him first, and then I'll bring him Vinirat Pnei Hashem." And then I'll bring him and he'll stay by Hashem Ad Olam forever. He'll stay by Hashem forever. So he says to her, do what's good in your eyes. And you could stay with the boy until you wean him. And may Hashem fulfill his word. And uh, sure enough, she goes back and she nurses the child until he is weaned, which is after two years. And then she goes up to bring him. Uh, so there's a, f a fascinating... Which is after, what'd you say? Two years? Two years old, yeah. Two years old. There's actually two texts in the Rashi here. One is 22 months, 
And then there's a, in the parentheses, it says, in other books, it says 24 months. So everyone says, oh, probably 22 is a typo. And 24 months is the correct amount because after it's 24 months. That's throughout the Talmud, it says 24 months is the period that a child is usually nursing. At the end of 24 months, he's not considered a nursing child anymore. Even if he's actually nursing, it's not essential for him. Interestingly enough, uh, there's an expression in Latin, which I don't remember because it's in Latin and I don't speak Latin, but it goes something like, the more difficult version is the correct one. That's an expression in Latin. When you have two versions of a text in front of you, you can assume that the more difficult version is the correct one. Why? Because nobody would change the text to say something that's, that doesn't that makes less sense, right? So if, if there's two versions and one of them is smooth, like this, 24 months, that's smooth, it makes more sense, you can assume that the correct version is actually the 22 months. So Yaakov Kamenetsky picks up on this and he makes a delightful and and a genius calculation to explain why Rashi says 22 months. Uh, but uh, uh, forgive me, I don't have it on hand. I, I, I read it, but it, it, was, it was brilliant, but I didn't, I didn't uh, remember it. Um, so yes, two years is the deadline, yeah. I didn't get what was Elkanah's, Elkanah's vow. He was going, going to pay his vow, but what was his vow? Yeah, so that's an interesting but, question. So it could be throughout the year a person makes vows I, you know, for, for different things that happen to him. It has been suggested that uh, it was a vow of thanks that once Shmuel was born, he made a vow to bring sacrifices and thanks to God. Perhaps it's that that would make it very appropriate and fitting to even mention. Um, I think Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky wanted to say that it's the the uh, the sacrifices that a lady brings after she gives birth. That really he was bringing the sacrifices on behalf of Hannah, but she was not able to go because she had to stay behind with Shmuel. So he was bringing them on her behalf. And you may appoint an agent to bring your sacrifices in, in most cases. Um, okay. There's uh, so much detail here, but I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm too excited. I'm going verse by verse. I, I really, we should cover more ground, right? Um, no. oh, wait. Verse by verse is fine with me. <laughs> okay. All right. If anybody's frustrated, just, you know, just make the remote motion and I'll go a little faster. <laughs> we'll go two times speed. Um, because doesn't Hannah have to undergo some rite of purification after childbirth? That's she not, does. She does. does but um, yeah, the, we need to say part of that is the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. If for a boy, it's um, it's after uh, is it forty four days. Uh, part of that is the sacrifices. But um, again, she he's doing he's doing that as her agent, and then she just goes to the mikvah, which she could do in her hometown. Um, but that's long before two years. She says to him, I want to stay with him for two years. Oh, so I wanted to share this. It was escaping me. There's a fascinating Rebbeinu Bechaye who says, Rebbeinu Bechaye was one of the early commentaries on the Chumash. Um, he, I, I, I believe he lived in the late 1200s. So you're talking about one of the early Rishonim. And he, or one of the Rishonim, I should say, um, but he says that as long as a child is nursing, he is not fit to, to really be influenced and elevated to a more spirit, to higher spiritual plane. So long as he's dependent on his mother to nurse, I guess he's too physical or too, he hasn't been developed enough to enable him to reach higher heights of, of holiness. So Khana here, therefore, would be saying two things. First of all, he's too young and fragile. He can't go up with you. Physically, he's not fit. But additionally, I plan on giving him to Hashem, meaning to say, I'm going to give him to Eli as an apprentice, and he's going to grow. He, ha he hasn't weaned yet, and he hasn't been weaned yet, and therefore he's not fit to absorb whatever he needs to absorb over there. So it, it would be premature to send him now because he's still nursing, so he's not going to be able to take, take in whatever he needs. A, a very interesting point. I, I can't explain it scientifically or spiritually. It's just an interesting aside. I heard about that, Rabbeinu Bechai, from... Rav Yitzchak uh, Lichtenstein. Okay. Okay, uh, there's one more thing to share here. It's, it's jam-packed. In verse number 22, he sa she says, I'm going to deliver Shmuel to, the, to Hashem once he's weaned. And he shall stay there forever. Which means, Chana is saying, I'm going to dedicate him. He'll stay with me for now, but I'm going to dedicate him to Hashem's service forever. For the rest of his life, he'll be there. 
but she said the words Ad Olam. Ad Olam could mean forever, but sometimes Ad Olam could mean until the Yovel, the 50th year, like we have in Parshas Mishpatim. If, this, if the Jewish slave likes his master, then right he, he gets his ear pierced, and then he serves his master, Ad Olam, forever. But that actually means, halachically, until the Yovel. Once the Yovel comes, the, the Jubilee year, the 50th year, that, that slave, even the one who said, I want to stay forever, he, only, he goes back home after, 50 year, after the 50th year. So Ad Olam could mean 50 years. And here, fascinatingly, Rashi brings down that she either said this prophetically or perhaps she sealed Shmuel's fate. He only lived 50 more years after he was weaned. He was two years old when she delivered him. And then he lived 50 years, which is Olam, one Yova, one Jubilee cycle of life. And then he died at the age of 52. So there's a fashion, fascinating allusion here to the age, to the final age of Shmuel, to the lifespan of Shmuel. Whether it's a punishment for the way she, she spoke or just an interesting like prophetic accident or coincidence, yeah, that it's it's unclear amongst the commentaries. Okay. Hannah, by the way, was 130 years old. Uh, that's another thing to put in here. So we move forward now. Finally, he's weaned in verse 24 after after uh, two years. And uh, they bring, After she weans him, She brings three bulls and uh, with sacrifices. I think it was a korban toda that she brought, a offering of thanks. Yeah. She brought an offering of thanks. I mean to say the inaugural, the initiation of Shmuel into the service of Hashem was with sacrifices, which is beautiful. They, they slaughtered the bull and then they brought the child to Eli. The Talmud says they brought the child to Eli for judgment. He had done something severely wrong. It says they slaughtered the bull. The Gemara inserts here, the Gemara in Brachos Lamed Aleph says that Eli at this point, the little two-year-old Eli, he had ruled halacha in front of his teacher. Excuse me, Shmuel. Shmuel was two years old. Forgive me. Shmuel here ruled the halacha in front of his teacher, who was Eli. They were looking for someone to shecht the bull, to slaughter the bull. And they said, hey, we need to find a Kohen to slaughter the bull. And Shmuel, the, the young Shmuel, who evidently was a smart boy, he said, you don't need a Kohen to shecht. Even a non-Kohen can shecht. The other parts of the service are essential for a Kohen to do. A Kohen must do them. But when it comes to Shechita, the very first uh, act of slaughtering the animal, that could be done even by a regular Israelite. And there's no need for you all to be searching for a Kohen. So the answer, he was correct. However, it was a mistake to issue a ruling or to say over halacha in front of, in, in the presence or in the domain of Eli. Here you are in Shiloh at the tabernacle and you're instructing the Kohanim what to do. That's a mistake. That's a mistake. And the punishment for issuing a ruling in front of your master, in front of your teacher, is death by the hands of heaven. Misa bi deshamayim. So Eli here on open, excuse me, Shmuel here on opening day has just subjected himself to possible death. Oh my goodness, he, he made a big mistake. How old was he at this time? It sounds like he was two years old. He sounds barely, like he was two years old. He could barely speak. I hear. There are stories of <laughs> the late, uh, let's see, the, Rav Yitzhak that would be like the 1800s, a very young children who were like prodigies, a child who would who would make a bracha before nursing from his mother. That's a story. That's a documented story from the 1800s. So a two-year-old could have the faculty of speech. Also, uh, when you begin teaching a child chumash, at least in the old days, they would begin with the sefer of Vayikra, the book of of Leviticus. And this halacha that anyone can shecht is the fifth verse in Leviticus. So it's very early into the learning. <laughs> so maybe that can. Maybe that can uh, explain why he knew it so young. But it, it is fascinating that you have here, or somehow he's able to issue a ruling in front of his master at such a young, young age. It's fascinating. You are saying, I mean, how many two-year-olds could do that? <laughs> I don't know any. <laughs> example that rejects the rule. 
He it, did they accept the rule? Did you ask? No, I say that uh, he is the. I, it was uh, who was who was who was. Uh, it was Shmuel is the one who said, hey, you guys don't have... Shmuel, the little two-year-old, is the one who, who issued yeah, the ruling. Shmuel is the exception to the rule, which is anybody anybody can shift. You're saying Shmuel is the exception to the rule? Well, who did the, who did the uh, shift thing? Was it Shmuel? They were looking for a Kohen to do it. They were looking for a Kohen, and he said, you don't need to find a Kohen. So right. I don't know who actually ended up shechting it. You're, that's a good question. Was it? Well, he's too young. He's not bar mitzvah yet. You'd have to know how to hold a knife and have an adult guiding you. He could yeah. technically have done it, but that would already be absurd, right? For a two-year-old to be shechting. <laughs> could have done it. He could have done it, but he could have. Yeah, theoretically, it would be possible. He, he was. He ruled that good. Yeah, he ruled that good. Interesting. If he's the one who did it, that's even more egregious, right? Not only did he say that it's fine, but he went ahead and he did it himself. So what's that's the fascinating. Question of the halacha. Uh, what did you say? I, you broke up it in here. So what is the halacha about? The halacha is that e even a non kohen can do the shechita. I, what's the reason for it? I don't know. Which. Which. <laughs> It's that's that's in a tractate. Uh, it's in a few places in Zevachim, and it's in, in Parshas Vayikra. It comes up that right. when it emphasizes that a Kohen has to do the rest of the service, but it never talks about a Kohen when it comes to Shechita. And therefore, from there, the Gemara, the Talmud learns that even a non-Kohen can do Shechita. So, just uh, very quickly, we'll go into the continuation here. So, he did something very serious here. So, as we're finding now, there's a whole story going on behind the text that's not uh, on the surface. And Shana turns to him very passionately suddenly, right? It's only explainable, understandable through the, the background we just offered. And Shana says to him, Be Adonim, my, my master, by your life, I am the lady standing before you uh, and davening to Hashem. Elanara Zait Palalti, I have davened for this boy. Hashem Shalati, Hashem Shalati, and Hashem has granted my request. And I've offered him to God. And they bowed before Hashem. Why is she giving this whole speech with the background of her davening for the child? She was davening for his life. She was asking Eli, please forgive him. You're the rabbi that he issued the ruling in front of. It's your honor that he that he uh, denigrated, that degraded. Please forgive him. Please forgo your honor to allow my child to live. Because this is the child that I prayed for. Which is a, a, an amazing thing. She had to pray for him to stay alive the very day she brought him to the temple. Um, and in fact, he accepts and they bow down before God, thanking God for, uh, I guess, for for allowing Shmuel to stay alive. There's just a beautiful prayer over here. Rashi says, uh, Elinar has verse 27, I've prayed for this boy. Rashi's saying, don't tell me, Eli, that this child will die and Hashem will give me another one, because maybe you're capable of doing that. You can give me blessings. You're a tzaddik. I don't want another child, a different child. This is the one that I prayed for. You can give me a new son, the greatest one ever, but that wouldn't be the one I prayed for. This boy has my prayers invested in him. And that's something that the next child won't have. That heartfelt prayer that I uttered in the, Mish in the Mishkan two years ago or three years ago, that is something that's not that's going to be missing from any, any consequence, from, from any uh, other child. And therefore, this is the one I prayed for. This is the one that I want. And, and sure enough, he's able to live. And in, verse, in chapter number two, we, I can't believe we didn't get to it. I, I, uh, I went a lot slower than I expected. Um, in chapter number two, the opening nine verses are a song of praise from Kana, where she thanks Hashem, um, or she talks about Hashem's great uh, power in Ashkacha. We'll hold it here. Next time we'll go a little quicker. I, I promise, but not really. <laughs> Can't promise, but God willing, we'll, we'll continue next time. All right, so All right. next week, Bezer Hashem will pick up from chapter two. And I hope you have a, have a great night and a wonderful Shabbos. So 8.15 next week, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye.